British officials who commit crimes on Kenyan soil will no longer have immunity. That is according to the latest MOU signed between the two countries. This is KTN Prime. Thank you for joining us. Let's take a look at our top stories tonight. A police officer to face murder charges for allegedly killing two university students. The ICC now writes to Kenyan Member of Parliament Moses Kuria over his claims of witness procurement. And in Tanzania, the Election Commission denies claims of rigging ahead of the October 25th poll. Welcome to the program. Our sign language interpreter tonight is Maresha Oweti Amlinda Ogutu. Let's begin with the education sector and the Employment and Labor Relations Court of Kenya has declined to stop an order for teachers in public schools to resume teaching. The court has directed the teachers' unions to comply with the court order and suspend their strike immediately. The striking teachers have maintained that they will not return to work until the government honors a pay rise ordered by the court. Students are hereby ordered to suspend for 90 days. The strike commenced on 1st September 2015, with the consequence that the respondent members do resume duties immediately. The court has ordered teachers to return to work even as the dispute over the 50-60% salary increment is heard by the Court of Appeal. Justice Nelson Abuotha of the Employment and Labor Relations declined to lift the orders suspending the ongoing strike for 90 days and for the second time ordered the tutors to resume duty immediately. In the ruling, Justice Abuotha said teachers must obey the orders he issued last Friday and return to class before he can consider their application to have the directive to end the strike lifted. Should they fail to heed the directive, striking teachers will find themselves in an awkward position of being accused of disobeying court orders, an accusation they have persistently pinned on the government of a failure to implement the contested salary award. Last Friday, after Justice Abuotha suspended the strike, the adamant union leaders urged their members to remain at home as they analyzed the ruling, which also required the warring parties to undertake to conciliation on how to resolve the dispute that has paralyzed learning in public schools for four weeks now. The strike remains absolutely active. Yeah. That's the fact. There should be no doubt and there should be no confusion about that. The judge had added that should the Kenya National Union of Teachers, NAT, and Kenya Union of Post-Primary Education Teachers, COPET, and government fail to reach a settlement within 90 days, they will be at liberty to take any lawful action against one another. Today, however, Justice Abuotha stood his ground that teachers ought to have resumed duty as directed by the court a week ago if they wanted to continue lawyers representing the union in an urgent application had asked Justice Abuotha to suspend his earlier orders pending the outcome of the ongoing court of appeal proceeding. They urged the court to rule in favor of the two unions as the government too had also not complied with some orders as directed by the court. However, the Attorney General through lawyer Emmanuel Bita strongly opposed the union's request on grounds that its members have failed to comply with the orders requiring them to go back to class, saying TSE has been unable to serve the two unions with the orders and sought for orders to serve the two unions to facilitate compliance. Justice Abuotha had asked Teachers Service Commission not to victimize teachers who had participated in the strike and called on the government to form a conciliatory committee and arbitrate the matter within one month. Following last week's ruling, the government ordered the reopening of schools on Monday. KTN News. 
So the court has ordered the teachers to suspend their strike. The teachers say they will not end that strike unless the government honors that 50 to 60 pay rise that was awarded to them by the courts as well. Tonight on KTN Prime, we're asking you, should the teachers continue to defy the order by the court to return to work? They say they will not return until the government honors a pay rise that was ordered by the court. So do you think the teachers should continue to defy the order by the court to return to work? Tweet us at KTN News. You can tweet me directly at Linda Ogutu, or you can send a short message to the number 22155. Kindly begin with a yes or a no so that we can be able to call uh, your opinion at the end of this bulletin. We'd love to know what you think on that. All right, so an official of the International Criminal Court has written an email seeking audience with Moses Courier over claims of procuring... William Ruto. The official uh, Brendan Rook says that he would like to meet Korea to discuss allegations that together with NAC Kenya Chair Martha Karua, they procured ICC witnesses. Moses Korea told the ICC official that he is willing to meet him at Parliament Building next Friday. <laughs> People who have never done and have been in church. The Jubilee Coalition has distanced itself from the move by Nandi Hills Member of Parliament Alfred Keter to collect signatures for the impeachment of Devolution Cabinet Secretary Anwai Guru. Led by National Assembly's Majority Leader Eden Duale, the Members of Parliament are accusing the legislator of being used by the opposition to divert attention. It was very clear. David Chiftiri has been cleared. Where is he? C.S. Felix Koske has been cleared. Where is he? When it comes to Waiguru, people start lecturing as the way it, it is going to divide uh, Jubilee. Waiguru is more Jubilee than other CSs. Then we should be told, why are you treating Waiguru's issue as special? Gilu is a woman and she was advised to step aside. CS Koske, who has been cleared for the last three months, he has been sitting outside the, the ministry and that ministry is very demanding and is not coming back. All these, all these issues are being reduced into politics because people want to protect C.S. Waiguru. You cannot give us special treatment. She is a C.S. like any other Kenyan, like any other C.S. And she needs to take the political responsibility by resigning and allowing investigation to go on in a, in a ministry. Why is it that when Waiguru's name is mentioned, people panic to the extent of making phone calls, terror phone calls, advising their friends to throw from that don't be seen even around there. Don't even include yourself in the list. Remove your name from the... the, the. And, and people have signed. So what Alfred Keter is doing, he is being used to create a diversionary scenario from the matter, the serious matter of the ICC. That the core coalition and those who are involved as Moses Kuri has alleged, in the ICC witness procurement, you know, serious procurement has taken place. I wish. So the, what they are trying to do is now they want to run away from that, so they have hired the services of one renegade Jubilee member in the name of Honorable Alfred Keter. Because Alfred Keter, we know, after he uh, finishes the business, he'll come back to us. Oh. He's just doing some business. <laughs> so the 216 of us, including Alfred Kater, we are waiting for the motion against C.S. Anway Guru. We will deal with it the way we dealt with this, the one for Kaimeni. We will deal with the one of the president. 
Let's now cross borders into Tanzania and the National Election Commission there has dismissed claims by the opposition that there are plans to rig the forthcoming general election. The opposition had accused the commission of lack of transparency, citing the failure to open the voter registration to scrutiny. Tanzanians go to the poll on October 25th to elect a successor to incumbent President Jakaya Kikwete. Here is KTN's news political editor Ben Kitele with the details from Tanzania. 2015, it is slightly more than three weeks to the October 25th general election here in Tanzania. And Tanzania's electoral managers, the National Elections Commission, NEC, have now come out to vehemently deny accusations made by the opposition coalition, the Ukawa coalition, that there were loopholes in the biometric voter registration system and in the whole electoral system uh, to make it possible for rigging to happen in the October 25th general election. The chairman of the National Elections Commission, retired Judge Justice Damien Lubuva, was addressing news editors on Thursday. We were now passing up on the tomb. In a bariki goli la mkukweni ni uchokozi tu. Yani ni, ni kuchokoza tume kwa enewa ambalo kwa kweli. Sio haki hata kidogo. Sio tunafuata kanuni na taratibu kuendesha uchaguzi. This has been the big story in local dailies here in Dar es Salaam and across the country. Those remarks were made by top delegate of the Ukawa coalition, John Nika, accusing uh, the National Elections Commission of uh, not being, treating the political parties in this election with the respect that they deserve. Uh, of course, making the accusation that the National Elections Commission did not or failed to give them uh, the preliminary voter register uh, to be able to scrutinize it. Uh, as is required by law. Those are remarks that were made on Wednesday here in Dar es Salaam. Bila kuhakiki uo mfumo wa kuskani matokeo na kuyatuma kuhakiki kwa karibu. Bado kuna mwanya hapo wa kufungwa bao la mkono na jaji rubuva anastahili kutoa maelezo juu ya jambo hili. Vyama vyote visiwe na wasiwasi katika zoezi hili waendelea na campaign zao kunadi sera zao ili wananchi wakiridhika wawachague lakini sio kwa, kwa, kwa goli la mkono kwa maana ya shortcut hakuna atakayepata shortcut a lot of pressure from the opposition political parties a lot of pr pressure on the national elections commission However, earlier the National Elections Commission did also release a few statistics, did announce the polling stations that will be used in the October 25th general election across the Republic of Tanzania. A total of 72,000 polling stations will be used in the election and of course uh, the numbers that have been very impressive on the part of the National Elections Commission, 23.7 million registered voters uh, will be taking part or seeking to take part in the October 25th general election. Ben Kitili, KTN News, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Let's stay in Tanzania and focus on the campaigns of opposition candidate Edward Loasana. <laughs> Let's bring you back into the country. A police officer will be charged with the murder of two university students in Nairobi in November last year. This follows an order from the Director of Public Prosecutions, Keriako Tobiko. Ian Wafula has the details of this story without uh, addressing this. What I'm not sure of is whether I'm addressing the government or the police officers that shot my son. The portrait of his son makes David Mackenzie nostalgic of the proud father he was. Humble, smart and responsible is how he describes Felix Magomere, now diseased. But when he talks about the circumstances of his son's death, the conversation brings to the fore the pain he has lived with for nearly one year now. But he's not the only one still grieving. 
Joseph Mose lost his nephew David Nyangina at the same time as David and under the same circumstances. And this is how fate brought the two together to fight for justice. The disease Felix and Dennis had arrived in Nairobi from Egerton University to apply for the help loans on the 7th of November 2014, the last day their families would hear from them. My sister, Pilia Nyangina, you called me that Dennis has gone missing for almost a week. Last time I talked to him, he wanted some money. I've sent the money, but he has not responded whether he has got the money or not. He told me this is that he has gone missing. I don't know Nairobi. Go back to Nairobi. I start the search. Now that we are not getting much from Central Police Station, so we went to Kampunj Police Station, and we were lucky to to get this uh, senior police officer from that end. So he said, uh, I remember very well. On 7th, I was not on duty in the evening, but in the room police walkie-talkie, I, I had some information that there were two students, not really students, there were two people who had been killed around Globe Roundabout. Close to three weeks later, it would turn out that on the same evening, the two boys would be shot to death at Nairobi's Globe Roundabout. The police claimed that they had been involved in criminal activities. However, the manner in which the incident was handled by the police left too many questions unanswered. First, it was the conflicting reports by the police officers, then the failure by the police to record the circumstances behind the incident on the occurrence book and how the bodies were handled at the city mortuary. According to the gate attendants, because that's where we got the, the GK number and the time they checked in. So she, she told me that it's good now that uh, now the family of the two boys now that you're around. There has been police officers who have been roaming around since then trying to find out whether the bodies have been you know moved or whether the, the owners have been identified. Investigations by the Independent Policing Oversight Authority corroborated with the family's report that the boys had arrived in Nairobi on the very same day and that indeed they were innocent. It goes on to give damning revelations that despite school identification cards with them, they were shot at and police labeled them as unidentified persons. But that is not all. It names Constable Patrick Duranira as the officer who not only shot at them, but also was off duty at the time and was armed with a police pistol, which he allegedly used to kill the two students. They had been informed that they were thieves and they were surprised because that was the first time I had they were they were doing the thieves because I've stayed with them since childhood. He has never in the local chiefs can tell you things was a number. In fact he, he had even sponsor from rural primary because he was very hard working. Well known the village. You can imagine uh, a, a young boy actually being gunned down by six bullets. How old was Felix? So I don't understand. Six bullets is, is, is human. That's not something that should happen to someone. Back in 2014, a report by the Independent Medical Legal Unit, IMLU, described the police in Kenya as, quote unquote, the number one killer, and that criminals had killed fewer people than police within the same year. Dennis and Felix joined the hundreds of people who've lost their lives in the hands of the very people who are meant to not only protect them but also uphold the law. In fact, a report by the Human Rights Commission said that between the years 2009 and 2014, at least 1,500 people lost their lives in the hands of police. Ian Ofula, KTN News, Nairobi. Thank you for staying with us. Let's now focus on that story that I told you um, earlier in this bulletin. British soldiers who previously enjoyed immunity from prosecution for crimes committed in Kenya will now be liable for their actions. The governments of Kenya and Britain have signed a memorandum of understanding that sets out the terms for the continued training of British troops in Kenya. Take a look. 
British troops have been training on Kenyan soil. The ties have been amicable for years, but alleged crimes such as human rights violations by British soldiers has put the strain in the relations. The question of jurisdiction over British troops training on Kenyan soil and Kenyan troops in Britain has one that has not always been easy to navigate. Every five years the MOU is renewed and now with the new constitution it's the first time it's being ratified under it. This time, provisions have been added to assure the Kenyan government that British soldiers training in Kenya would not enjoy immunity for crimes committed in Kenyan soil. As with international standard, a British soldier who commits a crime on Kenyan soil while off duty is prosecuted under Kenyan law. If they commit the crime while on duty, they are subjected to a court martial under the British military code, a provision that did not all go well with most Kenyans, especially with alleged rape offenses in Samburu and Nanyuki. With a new agreement investigations will be carried out jointly by both British and Kenyan investigators. Kenya has borne the brunt of terror given its proximity with Somalia. The country has always urged for international support to combat the vice, saying terror is a global phenomenon. Dorcas Wangira, KTN News. Let's now focus on what is unfortunately a perennial problem. Thousands of residents in Pokot North sub-county are staring at the grim face of hunger after their crops withered due to lack of sufficient rainfall. As most counties in the country are busy putting measures in place to avert effects of the predicted El Nino, residents of West Pokot are eagerly waiting for that rain. The residents are happy though that this year they may not be forced to migrate to Uganda in search of pasture and water. The country prepares for the El Nino rains. More than 67,000 people in West Pokot County are facing starvation following a prolonged drought. Areas mostly affected by the drought in the county are Konyao, Kacheliba, Kasei, Alale, Chepkobe, and Kanyar Kwat village along the Takwal Belt. Kacheliba Member of Parliament Mark Lomunokol has asked the government to urgently supply the residents with relief food. Later upon NDMA, National Drought Management Authority wakuje kwa haraka sana wakuje wafanya assessment because they are entitled to assess and inform the government so that the government may act to avert any debts um, any threat uh, that is related to lack of food. President said most farmers incurred huge losses since they never managed to harvest anything from their farms. The last received rainfall was in the month of June and this has forced many families to sleep on empty stomachs. <laughs> The drought has also affected learning in the constituency, with many schools being forced to close for lack of food and water. During the long dry seasons, the Pokot leave their permanent settlements and move their cattle to where there is pasture and water, often crossing forcibly into the territory of neighboring regions of Karamojong in Uganda. <laughs> Competition for scarce resources, particularly water and pasture, and the high value placed on cattle have produced a culture of raiding and warfare. The conflict has had great impact on the communities. Many men end up being killed in the raids, leaving widows to fend for themselves. The residents are now eagerly waiting for the El Nino rains to enable pastures to rejuvenate and feed their livestock which they are currently depending on. They are happy that this time they may not be forced to migrate as far as Uganda in search of food, water and pasture. Michelle Ngele, KTN News.
Thank you for keeping it. KTN, it's time now for business. I'm Joy Doreen Bira. The value of Kenya's exports dropped in the second quarter of the year, further putting pressure on the country's balance of payments. According to data from the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, export earnings dropped to 114 billion Kenya shillings during the three-month period from 115.5 billion shillings a year earlier. KTN's Charles Kitunga has more. Kenya's balance of payment worsened further in the second quarter of 2014, reflecting the country's inability to match exports and imports. The decrease in earnings was mainly occasioned by a decline in exports of non-food industrial supplies. According to the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, the current account deficit also deteriorated by 61.8% to 151.2 billion shillings, attributed to the increase in merchandise trade deficit that worsened to 246.3 billion. On the import side, the import bill dropped ever so slightly by 0.4% to 402 billion shillings, supported by a drop in the value of imported petroleum products as international oil prices fell during the quarter. According to the Statistics Bureau, the balance of payments has now worsened to a deficit of 47 billion shillings compared to a surplus of 166 billion shillings at the same period in 2014. On the winning side, trade in international services posted a surplus of 24.7 billion shillings. Financial account net inflows also increased by 11% to a surplus of 165 billion shillings from a surplus of 148 billion shillings in the second quarter of 2014. During the same quarter, remittances from the diaspora increased by 25.7 percent to 38 billion shillings. This came even as the economy slowed down to 5.5 percent growth compared to 6 percent growth in the same period of 2014. Charles Gitonga, KTN News. The Senate Select Committee investigating the affairs of Kenya Airways is demanding that the airline's management provide minutes of board meetings held over the last 10 years. The committee says Kenya Airways management has been uncooperative as far as presenting the minutes is concerned, therefore slowing down the inquiry process. Senate wrote to Kenya Airways on the 21st of September this year asking for the minutes, but so far that has not been met. The committee is now giving Kenya Airways management up to the 5th of this month to present the minutes. The documents are supposed to shed light on how decisions such as partnership with Dutch carrier KLM, human resource management and project Mawingu were arrived at. There's no need meeting them if we don't have the minutes. They should have the minutes so that our technical staff go through them, tell us exactly which minutes is relevant to what we're discussing, because we don't have time as a com committee. We can't be plowing ourselves through the minutes, but we have a technical team that does that. And there are civil servants which have sworn the oath of secrecy. So um, nobody should deny government uh, uh, documents that are necessary in the public good. So uh, I have a feeling that uh, um, this uh, uh, delay is, 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 is not proper. Kenya International Conference has signed a joint marketing deal with Kenya Airways to position Kenya as a favorable business tourism destination. The deal will see both entities advertise and bid for global conferences. Kenya has slowly been positioning itself as a major meeting, incentives and conferencing as well as exhibition market. KICC was charged with steering that market and the partnership with the national carrier is expected to reach a wider target market. As part of the deal, Kenya Airways is expected to offer the cheapest airfares during the time of booking for KICC staff travel on both domestic and international travel, as well as offer discounted rates on airfares for conferences or conference delegates. KQ will also use its international offices to pitch and market for major conferences to be hosted in Kenya. In 2015, Kenya has played host to the Global Entrepreneurship Summit and is lining to host the 10th Ministerial Conference on the World Trade Organization. Meetings, incentives, conference and exhibition is seen as one of the key pillars of growing the country's tourism sector. Global conferences provide a major boost to hotels with bookings made well in advance. Easy to access so that not only can you transact your business but also we provide you a venue that is of an international standard. And in order for us to compete as a country, as a system, we need to cooperate and this kind of cooperation where you see different sectors aligning
to drive the same strategic uh, uh, congruence is an important part of what Kenya will do to develop the hub and to develop facilities such as this one behind here. Now, the Kenya shilling has remained firm this week, though the stocks uh, seem to have, you know, gone down for the fifth session this week. Let's now take a look at how the markets did perform. And that's it for KTN Business. My name is Joy Doreen Bira, but you can log on to our website, ktnnews.com and standardmedia.co.ke for more news. For now, have a good night. Linda will be up next with sport. Thank you for staying with us. Let's look at sports now. Safari 7 has reached world rugby approval, placing the Kenyan tournament among other globally admired seven tournaments, with 14 teams having already jetted in for the tournament. Some of the teams taking part are sending out a warning to their opponents that the intentions lie on the top prize. With the Safari 7s defending champions, Welsh Warriors opting out of this year's championships, new entities are promising to give season side a run for their money. 2016 Olympic host Brazil are promising to spring surprises in the tournament. The South Americans who failed to beat the mark to make it to the core teams of the RB World 7s are using the Safari 7s to sharpen their armor in preparation for next year's Olympics. Brazil have been placed in pool A alongside Zambia, Spain and England Saxons. A very tough pool, so we are happy on that because we came here for uh, improve our our sevens. So all the all the matches, uh, the, the best matches that we can have here, it's it's good for us. So we are happy. So we are uh, looking for uh, other players to 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 make a a better team. England Saxons, on the other hand, is expected to light up this year's competition. The Saxons are hoping to emulate performances put in by their senior brothers in the IRB series as they take on the Safari 7s. The Saxons are relishing the chances of meeting a Kenyan side in the later stages of the competition. I always enjoy watching the Kenyans play. They play a great brand of 7s. Uh, they're exciting, big, physical, fast fast guys. So it's going to be exciting regardless of who we play. It's, it's, it's going to be a great tournament. We just need to control what we can control, put our game on the park um, and, and play to the best of our abilities. In the fixtures that have been released, Shuja, Western Province, Italy and Burundi are placed in Group A. Brazil, Spain, England and Zaxons make Group B. In Group C are Samurai, Zimbabwe and Uganda while Group D comprises of Australia icons, Namibia, Newcastle, Wales and Portugal. With only a few hours left before the Safari 7 kicks off at the Safaricom Stadium in Kasarani, this especially with the huge number of teams that have turned up for the competition. Robinson Okenye, KTN Sports. Let's see how that goes. The national women's hockey team is preparing for the All-African Games in South Africa, which will also be used as the Rio de Janeiro Olympic qualifiers slated for August 2016 in Brazil. The squad is optimistic that they will qualify despite tough opposition. Abdullah Ahmed with the details. A national hockey women's team comprising 26 ladies has been hard at work preparing for the Hockey All-Africa Games scheduled to take place between 23rd of October and 1st of November in South Africa. The team, under the watchful eye of coach William O'Kech, has been training at the Nairobi City Park Hockey Stadium for nearly two months, making final touches before they depart for the Continental Showpiece. The preparations are good. The girls, uh, the ladies are doing well. 
and they've uh, worked out and I think we are almost getting to our full potential. I'm optimistic because with the squad we have, we have so much talent here and with the preparations that we've had and the team that we have, for sure we'll, we'll play well. I'm confident that we'll play well in South Africa. We did not have the facilities required for the game, forcing the Africa Hockey Federation to organize a separate tournament in South Africa to serve as the Olympics qualifiers. We have been working hard trying uh, to get back to where we were. When uh, you go down, you hit uh, rock bottom, then uh, you can't go any lower. You have to start coming up. You must go into a fight expecting to win. That's too close, that's too close, Jackie. Kenya will face tough competition from eight teams including host nations South Africa who are ranked 11th in the world, Ghana, Nigeria, Zimbabwe and Namibia. Only one team will represent the continent in the Olympics. The team is making final preparations for the Olympic qualifiers, hoping that they will qualify for the first time in history. Abula Ahmed, KTN Sports. Staying with KTN Prime, let's remind you of a big question tonight. We asked you if you think teachers should, should continue to uh, defy the order by the court to return to work. Trust me, I have lots of feedback. I'm trying to, I'll try and see if I can uh, sample as many as I can. Oyego Onyino says, if the TSC promises to pay 50 to 60 percent in 90 days, they should go back. Otherwise, it will be a waste of time. Wanjiro says, no court said so. Let's stop uh, being a lawless nation. Those nut bosses are earning their pay. Giraf Ndungu says, this is what we call selective justice. Nicodemus Osoro says, are court orders only viable when they are directed at the poor? Wh why we can't obey, we won't obey. Holmes Com says, Government of Kenya walichimba kisima sasa itawabidi kuingia wenyewe kwanza kisha watafute mbinu za kujitoa. Svets says, no, but Kenyan's institutions have adopted ruling elite impunity to court orders. Shadra Cortez says, I wonder um, whether in Kenya there are superior rulings than others. What about the one that says that teachers should be paid? Collins Ogade says, yes, the law must be obeyed, although from the apex, let the initial judgment be acted on first, then this. Sylvester Aura says, why should teachers respect the judiciary when it lacks independence and unanimity in its rulings? Bad precedence. Linda Marcel says, walimu shikilia hapo hapo, dawa ya moto ni moto. Felix Akoko says, defying court order is against the law of the country. If the president can do it, why not teachers? Marin Jo Key. Um, but teachers are just following the good example by the government in disobeying orders. Very good example there. Ruto Benjamin says, yes, since the government defied, why should they not? Who is the government and who are they? Gideka says, yes, because the government also defied the court's order to pay teachers 50 to 60 percent salary increment. George Kweyu says, asks us, actually, why don't you ask the same about TSC obeying the court orders? Some of your feedback on our big question tonight on whether teachers should continue to return back to work. Teachers are saying they will not return back to work until the government honors that pay rise that was ordered by the court 50 to 60 percent. The Employment and Labor Relations Court um, declined to stop an order for teachers in public schools to resume teaching. So let's see how this plays out in the coming days. And that is where we leave it on KTN Prime tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good night. I'm Linda Ogutu inside Somalia. Premiers tonight with Kasi Mohamed. You need to take a look at that. It's very interesting. Have a good night.